Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, we're just going to take a few minutes to let the technology settle, and then we'll get started. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is our second event in the Cells Winter Speaker Series. The theme is Technoscience Beyond the Nation State. I'm Matthew Sample, Professor of Responsible Research and Innovation at Leibniz University Hanover. I'd also like to introduce my co-organizer, Anne Wynn, at the Faculty of Humanities, who will be moderator for Q&A and will also be participating in the discussion. Um, just a, a few pointers about format. Um, we have Norma at GRT Captioning providing captioning. If you want to turn that on, you can use the CC button on Zoom, or you can follow the link that I put in the chat. If you a question occurs to you and you want to ask uh, Akhil or sort of contribute it to our discussion, please send it to Anna using the chat function, and she'll collect the questions and maybe um, synthesize or call on you, depending on um, what fits. So maybe just a few words about the theme of the series. So science and technology, both historically and today are deeply entangled with nationalist projects. Uh, this means that they aid in the consolidation of power, providing the means for violence. Our hope is that over the course of the series, we can tackle both meanings implied in beyond the nation state. So that means we'll not only critique particular combinations of techno science and nationalism, um, but we'll also try to advance new ways to act and live together across borders and with international solidarity. So today we're joined by Akhil Kumarasamy, assist, assistant professor in Rutgers University New Works MFA program. She's the author of the novel Meet Us by the Roaring Sea, why we're here today, and also the linked story collection Half Gods published in 2018. Uh, it was named a New York Times Editor's Choice, uh, also awarded the Bard Fiction Prize and the Story Pri Prize Spotlight Award. Akhil's work has appeared in Harper's Magazine, American Short Fiction, and Bomb. And she's received fellowships from the University of East Anglia, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Yaddo, and the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture. So thank you everyone for being here. So let's start with um, hearing from Akhil. We have some readings to think about. Akhil, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt and Anna, for inviting me for the series. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, um, yeah, so Meet Us by the Roaring Sea takes place in the near future, the near futuristic NYC, um, and deals with an AI coder, and she's translating a, a manuscript that takes place in the 1990s um, about a group of female medical students, and they're living at the edge of a war and during a drought. Um, so uh, I thought I would just read a part of the kind of the near futuristic uh, part of the narrative. Uh, with the AI coder. Um, I picked this specific selection because um, in this kind of near futuristic world, uh, NYC, um, the, the, the US is doing a kind of a, a kind of data collection. Everyone has a kind of a, a kind of carbon score number monitoring, monitoring your kind of carbon uh, consumption. Um, so I thought you know um, it might be a good point to kind of um, start off the conversation. Uh, and in this section, she's just meeting a colleague at a bar. Your mother liked the term white noise because it revealed what might go unnoticed, the oppressive possibilities of sound. In the crowded bar, you must sit very close to Ricky to hear what he's saying. He has ordered a bacon cheeseburger with fries, a meal with a high carbon index. As you watch him eat, the saliva collects in your mouth. You, the vegetarian, don't have much moral high ground. You refrain from meat to reduce your carbon score to save money, not the planet. While you follow the rules, Ricky breaks them, intentionally exceeding his monthly limit and accumulating so many fines that you're surprised he still has credit. He's like your mother in that way. After three low impact beers, you are pleasantly buzzed. 
If the government really cared about our carbon score, it would tell us to reduce the number of children we have, but it doesn't because all it cares about is surveillance, Ricky says and licks the grease on his lips. What do you think the government's, government is really doing with our carbon score monitoring data? You look at him thoughtfully. I suppose they're training in AI with our CSM data, so one day it will rule us all and know whether we prefer American cheese or Swiss. Just wait, he says, and wipes his mouth. He is improbably skinny for his, for his level of consumption, so you sometimes wonder if he has a tapeworm or a wormhole leading all his excess calories to another Ricky living through a famine. At times, you feel like he is hiding away, deep inside a bunker, waiting for the end of the world, and there is no room for anyone else. We like to give a human spade to an AI to educate because it seems fairer, he says. But really, inside the machine is a tiny, flawed alien who we think is a god that we can't possibly begin to comprehend. Like humans are easy to comprehend. He grins and takes a sip of his beer. I know who you really are. Who I am. You're one of those AI whisperers, aren't you? He moves closer on the bench and you smell the distinct woody fragrance of his cologne, probably AI designed. I saw how you adjusted the optimization algorithm for the missing persons program, matching voices that have aged. Not many people have that kind of intuition, he says, and stretches his arms behind his head. I'm a third rate coder, but I'm fine with that. Do you remember that saying, success narrows, failure freeze? I think I must have taken it to heart at an early age. I have tried so many things, even studied fermentation for a while. I'm not afraid to be bad at something. When you become successful, you stay in the small realm of your talent and never venture out. You sip on your beer. Are you saying successful people are like narrow AIs that can only perform one specialized task? Please don't go comparing AI to humans. It never works. I would love for the day to come when androids exist and humans lose all sense of purpose, but right now a general AI can't even compete with a toddler. So you aren't afraid of the singularity. He grabs a few peanuts from the bowl and cracks them. Am I afraid of robots ruling over us? Well, there's colonialism and slavery, so I think most of the world already knows what it's like to be ruled over. You nod and raise a glass. You're on your fifth drink now, you think. Both of you have lost count. In the dimly lit room, everyone begins to lose objectivity. Hands, glasses, tables, spoons blend together. Ricky's head has the pleasing shape of a winter melon. The form transforms, but the essence remains, you say. He crushes a peanut shell in his fist and you inspect the ashy fragments as if, it could, as if they contain a secret of existence. Soon enough, you're telling him about the translation, radical compassion, and a girl named Yadra. As he listens, he stretches his head back and closes his eyes. They stay closed even after you finish speaking. Your mother used to play the keyboard with a dark cloth bandage over her eyes because she was sharpening her senses. It was the first time you thought deprivation could be a strength. When your mother left for her trips, you imagined she was training you for this future moment, telling you to close your eyes, find her without sight. I think I might stop here and maybe like jump over to like the next section. Um, that sounds great, yeah. Uh, and then this is also just a section, just also thinking about, like, you know, also talks, there's an AI ethics meeting. And it was with the same character, her colleague, Ricky. And they're back at the bar. It takes the annual AI ethics meeting for Ricky and you to finally head to the bar together. You both sit at your usual table and practice setting neutral intentions, just like Petrov had instructed. If I, if I, if I work on an AI system that wrongly identifies individuals as threats, it's not intentional, Ricky says. It's the data's fault, not your fault. If a housing selection AI model mostly chooses Anglo-sounding names, not intentional. If a whole village is blown up accidentally by autonomous device, not intentional, legally or in the clear. He eats a medium rare steak that you can tell is overcooked. It doesn't bother him. Bother him. He complains only about the music, says an AI can synthesize, synthesize, synthesize a better pop song. He talks loudly enough that people stare. His cheeks glow, reminding you of an early memory of him. 
And all the time you've spent together, you still don't know things about him, like his relationship with his family, the reason for his dreamless years, but you feel like you understand him in some deeper intuitive way. He rests his head and closes his eyes, how you imagine he must look when he goes to bed. After a few minutes, you think he, he might really have fallen asleep, but then he opens his lids and simply stares at the ceiling. Do you ever have the feeling that you're mostly composed of empty space, he asks. You swallow a mouthful of beer. Atoms are quite empty, so that sounds about right. But have you ever felt that space inside of you? Bogey's fathomless depths and Cheese's pearly gaze pass over you. Ricky takes your hand and places it on his back, near his right shoulder blade. He doesn't say anything, and when you finally let your fingers ease into him, you sink below the surface, a crevice as wide as a golf ball, an upside-down anthill swirling into nothingness. I went to all the doctors. They're not too sure what it is. One guy gave me a steroid cream. I'm supposed to rub in nightly, but it's not doing anything. Does it hurt? You won't be able to tell, but it's growing. I got this feeling that one day it's going to swallow me up. He gives you a quarter smile and you wedge your fingers under your thigh to keep them from tingling. My body is rebelling, he says. For what? He stares off into, this, into the crowd. There's really no distance between what we intend and what happens. We're always entangled. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing those with us. So there are so many themes that I, I wanted to ask you about. Um, but before I do, I want to encourage everyone that if you'd like to ask a question or um, hear more about specific themes, please send the, a message to Anna using the chat mm -hmm. and she'll moderate. So in, in the, while you're thinking about that, I wanted to ask you, Akil, about mm -hmm. this idea of moral community. So you mentioned um, the phrase in one of the readings, radical compassion. And it seems to me one thread that I noticed throughout the book is many of the characters, both in the sort of in the present of the book, which is the future, as well mm -hmm. as the characters in the historical document from the 90s, almost all of the characters are trying to develop ways to expand their empathy and sort of their moral considerability mm -hmm. of others beyond, you know, whatever their default moral cons consideration is. Yeah. And I'm curious if, if you could share a little bit about how did you, do you see this as a connecting theme and especially what to make of the fact that everyone seems to do it differently. So the, in the manuscript, they seem to use television as a way to think about what does it mean to be others in suffering? What does it mean to care mm -hmm. about someone who's far away from you? Um, another person in, in the present of the book uses mushrooms. Another, Rosalind uses um, sort of lab-made memories. So I, I'd love to hear more about this theme of what does it mean to extend your default moral attitudes to a larger community? Yeah, and um, thanks so much, Matthew, for the question. I think that's sort of kind of like at the crux of the book. And I was just thinking, like, how do we, how do we care about like the suffering of others? How do we kind of extend that kind of morality uh, on a kind of global scale? And um, I think uh, for me, I was just trying to use different lenses. For example, in the inner manuscript, these girls are you know they're in medical school and that um, they're trying to see beyond maybe like Western medicine and even like uh, their, their situation, they're living through a drought. So they're going through an enor enormous suffering. Uh, at the same time, there are refugees coming to their shoreline. So how do you kind of, um, how, do you, how do you care for others when you're, you yourself are suffering? How do you care for, uh, how, do you, um, how do you really become porous to somebody else in that way? And for them, the televisions are a way to just like to see the world and they're kind of like a portal. Um, connecting people to each other. Um, similarly, there's also televisions in, um, in the future manuscript and uh, there's this kind of TV show uh, about, like a, about a reality TV show about soldiers. Um, so I guess that, that question was like, you know, what happens when we witness the pain of others, like even through the mechanism of television, uh, um, the fact that we witness it, we remember it, the, uh, but that's the, does that really do anything? Um, is there, a, does that create any sort of change? Um, so I think these questions I was sort of just, um, I was circling um, and particularly thinking about the kind of the borders of compassion. Uh, for example, like if someone just jumped into like, uh, if someone fell into like subway tracks and someone jumped to save them and if they lived, people would be like, well, that person's so compassionate. They really have a really strong sense of the moral core. Uh, but if they die saving someone else, people might think that they're delirious. Um, 
So I'm just thinking about kind of the borders of morality, like what does that even mean to care about others? Uh, and also in the book, there's a sort of, there's an AI, there's an autonomous, autonomous car accident. Um, uh, and that also brings up another moral code question about that, bringing up that kind of trolley car problem is that, you know, question and like, is it better to save like, is one life better than five lives? Um, and I kind of complicate that a bit by just talking about um, how data is exchanged between the different car units and, um, um, is it is, is two elderly uh, 50 year old um, Pakistani Muslim uh, couple worth are there how are their lives compared to another uh, to a Caucasian couple a white couple a white woman and her toddler a baby uh, is it because is it are these decisions made off of age or just like how do we make these sort of decisions um, even thinking of the data um, yes yeah, so I was just thinking of kind of how how to think about compassion how to think about morality through the, the bigger structures like um, like this, like how we do data collection and how it's fed into uh, how we train uh, machine algorithms, um, and also just thinking about it on a very one one on one level. Like how do you care about someone? Like you know, you see someone who's houseless on the street. What does it mean to really uh, to sh extend care for somebody who you don't know on on your everyday life and people who are far away, like on television? So one thing that interested me is. In many, the stories is obviously beyond any particular country. It's a multi, there are several geographies at play. It's also the nation state isn't sort of in the foreground. And I think these days, politically speaking, our cultural moment, the default moral community tends to be the nation state. If like, who should we care about? Who gets the vaccines first? Yeah. The people within our borders. And you suggested that this is somehow beyond borders. And I'm curious if you, if in a way this is an optimistic vision, because um, I'm thinking of like Benedict Anderson's Imagine Communities, mm -hmm. he, he suggests that the purpose of, of the technology with respect to the nation state is to get everyone to think in terms of mm -hmm. us, us the nation, us Americans, or whatever nation state sort of nationalism is being promoted. Mm -hmm. But the technologies in, in your book, of course, are ambivalent, but they don't actually seem to there's not a lot of nationalism, or at least maybe except mm -hmm. for the, the military reality show. Mm -hmm. Can you comment a little bit on, like, is the technology helping? Is it hurting? What's the, is it, what's the vision for you? Yeah, and I guess going to that, back to that Benedict uh, quote too, just like, um, I guess, you know, with all techn technology, it's like, you know, how people in power are going to use the technology and then they can use it for nationalistic aims. Um, and I guess at the crux of the book, uh, like how do you care about kind of com communities outside your identity politics, outside your nation state? At the crux of the book, it's just like this um, young woman in the future and she's translating a text that doesn't even relate to her. She has no identity connection uh, with, the, with the Tamil manuscript that she's translating. Um, and it's also, I think both of the storylines are taking place in two different temporal times, like future, past, like somewhere in the past and geographic different locations. So I guess one of the questions was like, how can I, like, how can you have like these two places that seem so, two places, nation states that seem so disparate, how do you entangle them and make it seem like, um, uh, make them seem so like interconnected and also how like in, in, th in that question also thinking about like what is like international solidarity how can that look like um, so in the fact of using kind of translation as like sort of a, a kind of that mechanism of sort of um, in some ways kind of kind of sort of sort of solidarity um, and um, I guess in you know, thinking of the technology that runs like, runs through the book um, um, so there's televisions that are happening in the kind of the inner manuscript and like in the inner manuscript, I never named the nation state though. I like, it's probably, it probably sort of becomes sort of clear. I refer to like one nation as the Island, which is kind of, it's still like geographically, you could still tell it's kind of the border of kind of India and Sri Lanka. But I guess in my, one of my goals was trying to break away from that kind of the imagination state because um, all these borders, when I think specifically, when I think of like all the borders across the world, but and I think if, uh, South Asia, all the borders that like, were created, created were kind of um, created a lot of violence. There were always, always wars, like you know, from Kashmir to Bangladesh to even in, to the from between uh, the tip of India to Sri Lanka. That those are all kind of like violent borders up from some sort of colonial imagination. So try and think about like, how do you kind of break away from that even in uh, writing about those places. Um, 
And I guess, you know, television is like a way that like, you know, uh, uh, it could be, as you said, Matthew, like nationalistic aims, so we could all think the same. And it does that, like, you know, any sort of media form kind of like makes us like, you know, that's a portal of where we're kind of getting all our information. Um, but I guess it's, um, it's also this way of like, seeing the world and seeing things from um, what is happening in places you've never visited and also from the reality soldiers reality tv show like you could witness horrors um I guess that's a, a question like I was bringing up like how do you consume it like how does it go through our bodies and how does it change us and like um um is there a way to kind of like um is consume it and then like uh do something with it like in a way that feels like more imaginative or like full of possibilities yeah there were definitely was like a idea of a positive reuse of technology because I mean mm -hmm. the government provided the televisions, but then the the yeah. girl using it, they said, let's like sort of self-discipline ourselves, like mm -hmm. like in the sense of try to retrain how they think and how they see other people. So it's like repurposing technology for individual solidaristic yeah. uses. Mm -hmm. So I mean, as much as um, what I won't spoil the ending, but when I got to the end, I felt very torn emotionally. But there is a sort of a positive thread about mm -hmm. if if the names of the nations and, and the specific borders are somewhat arbitrary, how do we we move beyond that? Yeah. I, I really I, I was really fascinated by it. So I know Anna has some some questions of, of her own. So I'm gonna let take let her take over. Actually, I'm going to have Ozan, I'm going to ask to unmute Ozan, who has like a similar question, perhaps a follow-up to Matthew's mm -hmm. first two sets of questions. So Ozan, asking. Uh, okay. Hi. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot. So unfortunately, I haven't read the book yet, but uh, the parts that you read were really, very interesting. That made me really enthusiastic. What I would like to ask is, so what captured me a lot was the conversation and the direction of how uh, the surveillance and the kind of imagination of what you had in writing the book about AI, it, it still feels to me a bit at least that this kind of imagination is to a certain extent connected with how like the designers of uh, AI, mostly people who are uh, engaged in certain kind of oppressive practices themselves, imagine what kind of an entity would be like and this mm -hmm. kind of like a bit like creating god in their own image in a way and then they're just looking at how terrified it could be because then their role in that structure would not be being the god so they're creating the god that they would like to be serving and this is kind of the only powerful structure that they know is from their own subjectivity so mm -hmm. like do I don't I don't know like do you think there are these kind of possibilities within uh, fiction to go beyond and imagine uh, technology and AI not from this kind of like very big bad AI controlling surveillance way because I mean although I like many other people carry these kind of concerns sometimes I find myself thinking that but are they the kind of concerns that are just reflected and put on other people like colonized people and this is this like even my concern like should it be like this kind of question so this imagination yeah thanks so much for the question yeah it's like um um yeah, like, like, I guess like, you know, like, uh, you know, it, it seems like there's, there's some, like, you know, there is like this big fear that the, the big fear that, you know, like that, like the, the AI will like, you know, become this like sentiment thing and then like, it will take over and it will rule us. It seems like, it, 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 you know, it, it seems sometimes it feels detached from like historical, for, you know, because, you know, they're like, oh, yes, you know, you know, there's a history of, you know, colonialism, slavery, all these things have happened. And um, uh, it, in some ways, it seems more of like this, just more like of the fear from like the, the people of like the people of power are just like kind of projecting their own fears of what it what could happen to rule over them. Um, um, so and I think and then, you know so the, there's that, but I guess the, I guess the um, I guess more in an everyday life concern uh, that like I guess AI poses is just as, as you said like you know we're making like our own image of God like it's just the data is just our collective consciousness in some ways it is being used to to train um, different algorithms so it's going to be like there's going to be all these different um, 
the issues we have in our world is just going to be also kind of in 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 the AI technology, but also just amplified. Um, so um, so I guess in that in, the, in that way, there uh, you know that is concerning. But you know, as a, any technology, it's just like how people use it. Um, and if that becomes a sort of like a bar you know, a barrier in some ways for different things from like, you know, in our own from just from like the world we live in, from like, you know, from from jobs or just from how they're doing housing selection. So we see it on like kind of small scale, on a, a big scale, but just like it's happening kind of invisibly because it just seems like, you know, when you give it some when you give like make, you make your own God, it just feels like it's easier just to give your power away to it. because so, you know, like this, you know, this thing is fairer, even though it's just like us still. And just like um, used on a larger scale. Yeah. Thanks so much, Hassan. Um, I like to uh, jump in and ask a question that perhaps connects to Ozan and Matthew's questions, and especially the framing of imagined communities. I wonder how we might think of Arundhati Roy's really special piece called The End of Imagination, where she's talking about like how colonized. Uh, U.S. colonized imagination of science and technology and warfare have traveled into India. And, and you know, if anyone who's read it, she talks about how uh, dance and irrigation have kind of been part of this colonial imagination constructed by the United States, but um, uprooted by Modi's, mm -hmm. um, how would you say, leadership in India. Um, so whenever I teach Arundhati Roy's piece, I always think about what does it mean to actually end the imagination to begin anew? And mm -hmm. the question that I always think about when I read literature by authors on this kind of, what is the future of technology and what is the future of science? How do you escape and evade persistent colonial structures that always mm -hmm. inhabit those two domains? And especially, um, this might veer into a 15 minute question that we're, we're trying to avoid, but um, I also wanna think about how how you envision your stories in your first, or in your, um, it's not, you don't call it your debut novel, but the story collection called Half Gods. Mm -hmm. So I saw some themes that can connect and resonate with uh, Meet Us by the Roaring Sea. So there are references to the Sri Lankan Civil War, and the focus isn't so much on technology, but there's references to science. So we have um, people who aspire to be biologists, etymologists, and then I think someone was working in a pharmaceutical company in New Jersey at the end of the story. So that focus was more on how do you pr practice science in that, in that family narrative? And then um, I wonder why you shifted the focus from science to like a tech company in your, in your vision of the new world in and meet us by the Roaring Sea. Do you see a connection between science and technology? And why did you split it evenly into those two different pieces? Yeah, um, yeah, so I guess, you know, for the first book, um, I was also, you know, there's like, um, there was, uh, you know, I think um, for Matthew's question about th thinking about televisions could be used for nationalistic purposes, I felt that more, you know, very strongly in like half gods, uh, because, you know, it, it sort of takes starts off kind of like at the, um, it jumps around across time, but it starts off kind of near like, uh, the first story starts off at the end of the war. And then like on the television, all you see is sort of, sort of like images of like victory, like everything is over. So this kind of this kind of nationalistic um, uh, narrative about what has happened, even though like, you know, tens of thousands of people were killed and like they're, they're we're not showing those images, showing those kind of stories. So it's kind of this how this kind of uh, how like this kind of like the media image of kind of victory and how like how it's actually felt by like uh, families are kind of living um, away from the war. Uh, the, how it's still affecting them across time, space, um, and I think in that in that story specifically, I was uh, in that not in that book. Uh, uh, it ends with a story about like someone who was uh, uh, a tea plantation worker who becomes stateless and ends up going to India, being deported, leaving, going to India, and also feeling like they don't belong anywhere and kind of becoming, um, and you know, without you know, uh, in some ways, like kind of living within themselves, like like a country, like becoming the sort of like you know, with strange customs and becoming the sort of country identity, you know, just like living as a, your own country. Um, so I think from there, I was like kind of very interested. I you know, I think uh, of the of like both. Um, uh, those the larger forces that kind of rule our lives. So I was like, I'm like, how do we really talk about these larger structures, both from like both like the media structure and also AI? That's you know, just like even these larger structures that you know from like data collection. How do you talk about the effects of the effects of those on a, um, 
on your life and how do I kind of entangle the reader like in this book I you know I write, use it the second person the you and I use the first person plural and those are two tenses that just like the perspectives that kind of just force that can include the reader like you know uh, they could be part of the narrative in some ways um, so I kind of wanted both the book to kind of feel like it's also entangling the reader um, uh, but, you know, going back to your question, Anna, about the, you know, how do you imagine beyond colonialism? How do you imagine beyond, you know, all, uh, beyond these kind of constructs that we have in our world? Um, you know, I think that's a, that's a difficult question. I think maybe like spaces like, um, uh, you know, maybe like things like science fiction allows you to maybe experiment with what that might mean, though it might not feel like a perfect solution. Um, uh, the fact that the book deals with the translation, it's like, you know, translating a text that feels kind of anti-colonial into English feels a kind of like a bit like a monstrosity because it's like maybe all text shouldn't be translated, like maybe like some text shouldn't be, uh, but this AI coder is still translating this text um, into English, into the colonial language. So it's just, uh, I think it's maybe just kind of grappling with what that means. Like, uh, what does it mean? You know, now that she translated to English, it has a bigger audience. More people will read it, more people will consume it, but at what cost is that too? Um, so I think I'm like uh, trying to like play around with what that imagination might look like or how people might challenge these big structures. Like even the main character has like an AI project. And like, what do you do when you're in these entrenched in these systems or doing awful things? Like you're a part of a company, all the people who work in this company seem fine. They seem like fine people, but they're, they're, they're part of something of larger structures that are they're doing things that, you know, that will be, that will, that, you know, that could harm people on a larger level. Uh, but what do you do on that, on an individual basis to try to imagine something differently? Um, um, I think even um, the idea of radical compassion was my also attempt to trying to think of like, how do we try to imagine some sort of more porousness between people? Like, how do you really try to care about other people? Um, yeah, so I guess going, going back to our under the boy, like how do you um, how do you try to, you're, you're trying to imagine the space but beyond capitalism, beyond all these structures. Um, and I think like the the character struggle, they you know, just the fact that they could imagine it, even if it might not be in a success, it might not come to pass, but like I think just like the act of imagination in itself could be some sort of like victory. Mm. I also want to think about the genre we call speculative fiction. Um, when we had Wakey Wong last mm. last year, last semester, for uh, she was talking about Joan is okay in addition to chemistry. When um, I asked her what's like to be a writer writing about contemporary science and not the future, because a, a lot of people, especially academics, they really grasp onto the sci-fi speculative fiction types of stories and she says something that made us both laugh she said I can't I don't want to write about flying cars and and robots she's like I'm not I, my imagination is actually that is limited to writing about the contemporary structures yeah. and I wonder um I know in your acknowledgments you were you listed a few I think some were academic some weren't um books that you you read and thought about as you wrote your novel and I wonder when when people say speculative fiction, why are they always like looking into beyond the future? And and I ask this because your spec speculation of the future is very much kind of like the future that we're in right now, or like the present future, I suppose, because we're having we're dealing with the same kind of questions about um, do we really want autonomous cars? Are they not racist? You know, like mm -hmm. algorithms of oppression, that kind of. Um, re those references are very resonant in your book mm -hmm. and I wonder have you encountered someone who said this isn't the future this is just how we live our life now and then what are like what would really be a future that doesn't look like what we're what we're in now kind of like thinking through Elon Musk's vision yeah. for Twitter and like the the digital sphere mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Cause um, yeah, because like, you know, I think like like science fiction or like these spaces are not necessarily for like they're not used as a sort of like prediction. Like um, Ursula Le Guin just says like science fiction is just like a tool, just like a metaphor for the present moment. It's just like it's just like another mechanism to speak about the present. Uh it just gives us new metaphors. Um, so I, I do think like the, the book does like, you know, it doesn't seem necessarily very far off. It's like, you know, it's much clearer. You know, even the AI I talk about, it feels very, very close and grounded to our own AI. There's no like androids. That seems like, you know, very much in the future. And, and like that was important for me to just like write a book that also felt very present. It's like you know, maybe using 
slightly new metaphors to talk about things just to give just to defamiliarize ourselves to some of the conversations we've been having um, um so yeah just, just using those new metaphors and I guess you know this it's interesting that kind of border of like you know spec you know I think there's also like um there's like you know of course different genres especially like uh, when you say the word science fiction there's also certain sort of assumptions that go along with it um and then like you know there's like also this hierarchy and, and some writers, you know, like make moves to say like, oh, it's just speculative fiction. Um, I have a friend who always says like, oh yeah, all fiction is speculative because it's just like, it's not real. You know, it's just, we're, we're all kind of speculating in, in different ways. Um, but, uh, but I think for this book in particular, I was interested in using both kind of like high technology and low technology, meaning like, you know, she's an AI coder, but then she's like also manually doing a translation and just like having all these different kinds of technology sort of in conversation and how they are, um, um, and like you know, also her mom um, collects archives of the past and you know, she's like, you know, so she's using like actually physical video cassettes. So um, I think I wanted like kind of like this range of technology just like to just to be present in the book. Um, uh, so just the existence of them together in some sort of archive just to have a conversation. Hmm. So um, I maybe wanted to push a little bit more on this, um, how to integrate sort of expert analytical mm -hmm. texts and, mm -hmm. and fiction. Um, you can, I mean, if I, I invite you to think about it, however it works for you, like in terms of like method or craft or in terms of theory, um, but I'm definitely on the theory side of things. I spend all my time writing theoretical articles and it's certainly not clear, for example, if if an author picked up one of my pieces, I'm not sure what I would want them to do with it. Like, I'm, obviously, there are certain things about the world that I want to foreground. I want to critique some things. I want to bring, describe some things in a way that are enlightening. Um, but for example, when you read uh, Ruha's Race After Technology, which parts of it did you did you keep? I mean, so there's a vision for for like there's she has an like overarching, I think, political vision. There's also descriptions of like specific things like just examples um what else I, i'm yeah so I, I i'd love to hear more about when you read it sort of did you take notes did you yeah. treat it like a research project or was it more just letting it sort of wash over <laughs> you and then and then write separately yeah no, that's, a, that's a good question yeah um um yeah and as you said uh yeah, I she said I know I do I do have like I, I do mention a couple of people in the back. Um, I do take I think I I, I I both like read it and also just like kind of take notes and like think think about what sticks and what kind of resonates. Um, and it might not translate into like like oh this this thing exactly from Ruha, but like just idea just like even thinking about Ruha talks a lot of things about glitching. How a glitch can also just be like this is actually how it works, it's not a glitch. You know, this is just how the system is really showing its true true colors. Um, and also from like, I also, you know, read uh, Coco Fusco's uh, has this book called uh, Females Guide to Interrogation, Field Guide to Interrogation. Um, and just thinking about kind of the uh, kind of the role of women in war and from like a really female gaze and also from thinking from like uh, from a military point of view. Um, cause a lot of the book was also thinking about, like, okay, uh, thinking about, um, uh, I have these, you know, uh, this idea of compassion, Could compassion be considered something, you know, compassion's usually think of, thought of something as sort of weak is not, not considered as something that's really like, there's like, like strength and compassion. So putting these th things in conversation, these young women, like who were, you know, doing compassion and then after reading Coco's book, thinking about like how, how, um, how sold young female soldiers are using kind of even sexuality or different things from like um, from like period blood stains menstruation as a way as a torturing torturing technique and just having that in conversation um i did take you know even i was reading melanie mitchell's book um just taking a lot of about uh, artificial intelligence taking notes and um and also just seeing how you could um uh you you take an idea and you try to pull on it, pull on the seams a bit more and think about how you could put it into a, more, a situation. Uh, like even for that, um, uh, even there's a part in Melanie Mitchell's book where she just talks about how an AI, um, how you could just change one pixel and it changes something. Uh, an AI could can read, can read it completely differently and just from changing one pixel and how you could just sort of, how you could take some sort of an idea like that and kind of complicate that in the narrative. Um, 
so using that as a sort of like groundwork um and also i have like a coding background so just even thinking of like my own experiences like doing coding and stuff and bringing it in um in a way that feels both like oh it's like it feels like in touch grounded like in the, the real world but also you're taking some sort of imaginative leaps too so it feels like you're also giving another spin i'm curious did you i mean so there's obviously a lot of different you're trying to do a lot of different things in the in the text mm -hmm. and part of that's built in because there's the present of the book and then there's the translation the translated manuscript which the reader reads mm -hmm. in parallel to the present story um did you ever did you get any pushback from early readers or you don't have to say who but did you ever get any early pushback saying you know it's it's too hard or it's too challenging people won't um they won't immediately get it that they, they're not patient enough was this ever a concern yeah i guess um uh, I guess for it was more for like me as writing it, like how do I make the, like, the inner manuscript feel resonant and like affect the like, outer, like what's happening in the outer world? Like how do I make both of those narratives speak to each other and have a kaleidoscope effect? And then, um, yeah, but you know, when I feel like uh, whenever like you jump between like two like kind of radically different sort of narratives almost, um, there is potential for it to seem like be, to be very difficult. Um, uh, so I guess that, I guess, uh, as I, was, as I was writing it, I actually thought I was just going to write like a simple narrative that just took place in one timeline and one geography, and then this this happened. So, uh, but um, uh, but I think the biggest thing was just to make sure both of those both of those things both of those two narratives felt really intertwined, and then like they felt like they were speaking to each other and adding meaning to each other. Well, I think it was a huge success. I mean, that that's the whole reason why we want we were so pleased to have you here today <laughs> is because if it was just one geography, yeah, <laughs> you'd really miss the this idea yeah. of, of of distant distant scenes, dis, distant selves. Mm -hmm. um, and for people who haven't read it, I will assure you that there's lots of rewards <laughs> for if you read the two the two pieces as they're juxtaposed. Um, Akil has left lots of things that are sort of clues, hints, revelations that actually link the two. So it's, for me, it, there was, it wasn't really um, that much of a challenge because you're waiting, you wait for like always more of the world to be filled in. Mm -hmm. And so as a reader, it sort of just flows. You can just switch back and forth and learn more about both worlds. And it's, yeah, for me, it was really flawless. Wow, thanks so much, Matt. That's really meaningful. <laughs> I think um, Anna has uh, some questions maybe. Hello? My, okay, making sure. Um, so Akila, I, you mentioned the word archive, and it's been interesting to see how this, like to quote Derrida's archive fever, which technically people have been misusing because he was talking more about like te early technology. It's like the email, and then he's also trying to make a Fordian argument about the archive. And I'm, I'm curious to know, the idea of an archive for writers, I think when we had our mutual friend Asako on, she also mm -hmm. talked about how she, she did research in the archives. And one of the question is, how do you use materials from the past? Like if you just do a, like a, a very straightforward textual reading, how, what's your responsibility as a writer and a critical reader to know like, how do you recontextualize something historical into the present for what purposes? And if if you ever and my my question to you would be, would be if you were in the archives would you did you have this moment where you thought I, I'm not sure how distant how distant I have to be to use this kind of research and mm -hmm. how do you cooperate these kind of like testimonies are silent yeah yeah I know that's a good question and I know like, Asako and I have talked about like even like her use of research for her work and like especially narratives that have been sort of suppressed and also like how do you talk about like the sort of different kinds of violence um I know you know specifically when I also think of my first book Half Gods um at the time I was also ha helping an organization uh that was kind of like recording different massacres and trying to keep a record of like different massacres that happened uh in Sri Lanka Elam and um so as I was doing looking at the, all these different massacres uh, um, I, I was working on this, I, I had already worked on the short story about a boy going missing. Uh, and then as I was revising the story, it turned out to be a story about this kind of entomologist, this father who has a missing son. Um, and he goes to different, uh, he goes to different um, sites of massacres and he's, you know, looking for new insects. So it's kind of this sort of a kind of bizarre kind of um, unusual um, way to use like 
kind of points of violence, these points of massacres, uh, to um, uh, to talk about uh, to talk about um, uh, what, what was, what's happening on the larger scale. Um, you know, so both like, like how do you like um, how do you kind of um, uh, how, you know, I think this big question is like, how do you talk about violence? How do you talk about things not in an exploitative way? Like, how do you use an archive? Like, how do you use material that doesn't feel exploitative? Doesn't feel like you're um, kind of taking advantage of it. Um, so I did look at a lot of work by things by people like Hassan Blasim, like the Iraqi writer, who like also just you know, I think talks about talks about violence through an imaginative lens. Like he makes he pushes into the even fantastical, and that helps you talk about the absurdity of violence too. Um, and then also in this book, I actually was in a different, looking at different archives. I was at the Schomburg Center for Black, uh, Black Culture, and then I was also in the jazz archives. But not much, like I wasn't necessarily sure how I was going to use the archives. Um, but um, it, it was just so, um, I know, there was, there's so, there's such a special thing just to look at ephemera of, of people who have like passed away and just seeing pieces of unfinished things. You see grocery lists, you see all these little pieces, and you're trying to kind of come up with different lives. Someone who I kind of like was became acquainted to in the archive was Philippa Schuyler, who was this um, biracial uh, pianist who was like, you know, like a, pro a prodigy who's like not as well known today. Um, and she was just like a really, like a really um, kind of phenomenal and also just like kind of had such an eccentric mind, uh, taught herself many languages. Uh, and had, yeah, so I was kind of thinking about also how do you kind of preserve people like in the book, a book, a book can act as an archive and how you could maybe um, bring people back, um, even uh, by, by, by kind of putting them into like into your novel and also just like even the fact of the narrator is translating a manuscript because she's trying to bring back these bunch of girls back to life almost like the act of translation can also be an act of resuscitation and like um, restoration. So kind of thinking of that line too. I have maybe a similar follow-up question about, I'm pretty fascinated about MFAs in general, because <laughs> I think like if I, it doesn't work out for me as an academic, I would probably risk another degree in MFA. However, I, I wonder, because, you know, in PhD, most of the time you're supposed to know a canon, you're supposed to know theoretical debates. And I think I would, because my, my intervention is kind of like not thinking of theory and literature as separate, like they actually are pretty robust in collaboration or collaborative dialogue together. Um, in your MFA programs, were you, were you assigned to read theoretical texts? I've uh, actually not as much as they should. <laughs> okay. It was mostly, I feel like uh, the most, like, you know, we had to read was like craft books, like, you know, craft books, mm -hmm. just, um, but not much, not, not much theory, which I feel like it's a definitely this sort of like, like kind of just like this big kind of like void mm -hmm. in the space of not reading as there much theoretical text. Um, I think uh, maybe I think in the PhD programs, they do that more versus like MFA, because then you have to also do a critical, there's a critical component. Yeah, I'm not like saying yeah. he's better at reading critical theory, but from what I've noticed throughout the speaker series, and then when I interview authors for my podcast, there is a strong understanding of theory mm -hmm. in, in the sense like you don't, you're, it's not formally learned. I don't even know yeah. if it's really important, but um, I'm curious to know when, when and if you're invited to academic spaces to talk about your literature, do, do people seem to act as if you don't you don't know how to properly use theory or like your citations how because I actually experienced that myself a lot of the times like they have they have this kind of ownership over theory and who gets to use theory and I consider both of your 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 books um, Half Gods and Me, Me Does by the Roaring Sea as pretty pretty critical and also very dense and in the best way possible but there, there is a very particular framing about the world and the way we understand ourselves yeah. that that I think like being on um, being an academic lecturing doesn't seem um, it's, it seems almost less rewarding in some sense yeah yeah I think I think yeah I think there is probably you know uh, there's probably these assumptions that you don't you know you're not as familiar with theory or like uh, you're not going to be engaging with it or like uh, uh 
or even like maybe even like the questions that uh like they'll just come uh, the questions will just be from like a like a not even a craft element just maybe just maybe a craft or just like maybe more just like the act of writing like how do you write uh on that level uh and it's not necessarily engaging with maybe the kind of the, the ideas the theoretical kind of your own like perspective what you're bringing mm -hmm. into like a larger theoretical you know context yeah. so yeah yeah which is very silly because a lot of academics have also turned to the literary yeah it's like no so it's kind of like and it <laughs> and it's like also you know like the, the, the big people that we think of you know even like w.e.b du bois he wrote, mm -hmm. a, he wrote he wrote a romance novel yeah, like he i read also, your electric yeah, article actually yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, yeah he, wrote, he just like you know and he also used to have like essays poetry everything mm -hmm. in one book you know it's like it, so he, he just used like every genre like every genre every like medium he was just like um had possibilities for him yeah yeah So the hour has flown by. Um, I, maybe I really appreciate you. I appreciate you indulging all of our curiosities and methods mm -hmm. questions. What are you going to work on next? Do you have um, new works in the pipeline? Am I not allowed to ask that question? <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, I guess it's. Um, I guess it's still in like the early stage. Uh, but yeah, just working on a novel. Uh, but now my process. My process has changed over the course of the books. Like, but now I, I do a lot of more just like thinking and kind of collecting versus like. Uh, just writing right away um so it's still in that kind of gathering phase and seeing kind of what what emerges yeah well if you need any boring academic papers i've got i'm, I'm ready, I'll ready. Them. send them over matthew <laughs> <laughs> all right well um thank you so much akil for sharing yeah, you. your time with us i really appreciate it and thanks uh everyone in the audience for for spending time with us as well and norma for the for the captioning help i yeah. think that's all from us today Please join us um, for the future events. You can check out um, our website here. I'll put it in the in the chat. We hope to see you there. In the meantime, thanks again, everyone. Yeah. Thanks so much for inviting me. Bye.